getting into the meat of it, once you have the essential tenets down, the rest of it moves kind of fast because there's these large bites, as it were. But then we come to this last section, and it almost seems, it almost seems like there's a bunch of different ideas all here at the end. One for, for this situation or one for that situation, and absolutely, absolutely, you could break it apart like that if you'd like, but I think there's one central thought going through all of these verses, all the way to the last two, which do form the official end of the letter, and that's the way that we're going to tackle it this time through the uh, letter from James, but I'm going to start reading at verse 12, read to the end, and we'll see where the Lord takes us today, so James chapter 5, starting at verse 12, but above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no lest you fall into judgment. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months, and he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced his fruits. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his waves will, error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. When I was on the road with the police department, catching liars was kind of part of the job. You got, look, you, you got used to looking for aspects, ticks, tells, things that would inform you if a person was saying what they were saying was truthful or not. And eventually you started to get just kind of a gut reaction to it, a, a sixth sense if, if you were, and so much of the job was really that. It was just trying to find the real behind the fake. And sometimes the deception was so complete, it was so deep, it was hard to figure out what was true and what was false. But then there were other people who were so over the top with their deceit that their lies could be seen from outer space. And these lies were often accompanied with the telltale sign, the unnecessary oath. For instance, you would ask somebody a very simple question like, well, where are you going tonight? And they would suddenly say something like, as God is my witness, I'm going home. I swear on a stack of Bibles, I was going to the store. On my mama's grave, I was going to church. And she's not even dead yet. And that one always floored me. But then you would ask yourself, my question wasn't really that serious. Where are you going tonight? If they act, react like that to this, I wonder what else they're hiding. Truth is, it's a sad statement that so many people feel a need to buttress their statements with qualifiers of this nature. Like somebody who says literally, literally after everything that they say. I get it. Until you tell me otherwise, I'm going to assume that what you're saying is a literal statement. But it speaks to the insecurity of an individual that that person does not feel like their character is enough for their word to be trusted. I have to tell you that this literally is what happened because if not, you're going to think I'm making it up. There's a sadness to that. But they feel like something else has to be brought into the equation just so the statement can be believed. And James is going to speak right to this idea as he begins the end of the letter. Now, depending on your Bible, you may have it broken into sections, into headings, and you see this one particular verse, verse 12, kind of off by itself. It's not in the next heading yet, possibly, but it kind of has a space before it, maybe a space after it. And while many Bibles do show this separation between this verse and what goes before it and the final section that follows you, I submit to you that this verse is actually the first verse of the last section. And I say this because the verses before it don't really smoothly connect to it. And prior to it, James is talking about don't grumble, don't talk about other Christians. Deal with things with perseverance. Last through it, last through those difficult times. Then there's this verse out of nowhere that says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. And then James goes, pray for and through all of life's circumstances. So I ask you, as you're a Bible student, as you look at this, is verse 12 connected to what came before it? Or is it connected to what comes after it? This is my thought that I'm submitting to you for your consideration. 
Verse 12 is the application of an idea that most of us adhere to, something we kind of cherish here at this body. We're the church of the real. We simply are who we are. What you see is what you're going to get. You're not going to get a lot of fluff and games. We don't pretend to be something that we're not. I mean, let's be honest, who would pretend to be people like us? And I think that this is what James is saying to the right reader. He's saying, don't swear by heaven or earth, above or earth below. You know, don't swear at all. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. Just be who you be and let that be enough. The application of this core theme about character being demonstrated by speech is then found in all the verses that follow it. Pray, sing, call, pray, confess, pray, for the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous saint avails much. They're all speech-related, the things that you're going to say, the the things you're going to breathe into the life of another person, as it were. And we'll look at some of those things a little bit finer as we go through the passage, but first we need to consider the phrase that's at the beginning of James 5.12, above all. Now, the two Greek words in this phrase have the idea of something that's higher, something that's superior to every other thing. Of all the things I've told you so far, above all of that, I tell you this. When we understand that, then we see that in the mind of James, this exhortation of verse 12 about letting your yes be yes and your no be no is above everything else. And he's told us some pretty weighty stuff about not playing favorites, about not treating one person this way and another person that way based on the way they have the ability to be a blessing to you. But this exhortation about our speech, he feels it's the most important one he had to give us. Now, this directive has its roots in Matthew chapter 5, right, where on the Sermon on the Mount, and yes, again, before we close, we're going to have another Sermon on the Mount reference inside this letter from James. But in this passage, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is teaching the people, and he says to them, you have been told that you should not swear falsely, but I tell you that you shouldn't swear at all. When we hear that we should not swear, our mind tends to interpret that as not using profanity. That's the way we kind of use it in our our modern age. Don't curse. Don't use curse words. But the idea that Jesus is using is more nuanced and actually far more inclusive than that. You see, at the time, the Jewish people tried to find ways to get around the third commandment to not take the Lord's name in vain. So instead of taking the Lord's name in vain and taking oaths by the Lord's name, what they do is they would swear by heaven or by earth, or even by their very head. Jesus tells them that you shouldn't do this at all. Anything that you can swear by falls under the dominion of God. It doesn't belong to you. You don't get to swear by it. So stop trying to add things to your character as a way of avoiding fixing your character. If you're that worried that someone else won't believe you, then the problem is not your words. The problem is you. Fix you, and then they'll believe what it is that you say. At the root of this exhortation is this understanding, just be who you are. Be who what what, uh, God wants you to be, and if we're walking with God as we should be walking with God, then we should be able to let our yes be yes and our no be no. That should be the quality of a Christian. We're not called to be whatever we want to be. Again, this is James 1.4 being a plot. This is how James started the entire letter, remember? Letting patience have its perfect work. God is changing us through the trials that we go through, the circumstances that we go to. He is making us perfect and complete, or as Paul put it, we are being conformed, we are being transformed daily into the image of Christ. And if we're living like that, then no one should need to doubt our words. No one should need to doubt our faith. We simply are who we are wherever we go. And part of who we are called to be that James is highlighting is we're called to be a praying people. We don't just pray at church. We don't just pray when we need stuff. We pray everywhere we go because wherever we go, there we are. And since we are always who we are, there's no need to change from church Anthony to work Anthony to outside world Anthony. This doesn't mean that we needlessly offend in the name of our convenience. Well, this is just who I am. You'll have to deal with it. Eh, That's not what he's saying. It means that the essential core of who we are is unchanged no matter where we are. Circumstances don't change who we are in Christ. So why are we praying? Why does James put this context of the final exhortation predominantly through the lens of prayer? Because remember how he starts, verse 12, but above all. 
Let your yes be yes and your no be no. And then he starts going through all these things that you're going to do with your tongue, these things that you're going to say and you're going to talk. And the vast majority of them are all about prayer. And I suggest that he does this for a couple of reasons. For one, all of our speech is before God. Everything you say out loud and everything you think in your heart, it's all laid bare before him. And therefore, everything that comes out of our heart is accountable to him. Just because you didn't say it out loud doesn't mean he didn't hear it. Secondly, James understands that all of our prayers are directed to God. They should be if you're a Christian. If you're a disciple of Jesus, when you are praying, you should understand that you're talking to God. That's the way James brings it out here. When you're praying, when you're praised, it's all to God. Even when you call the elders, even when he says, when you're sick, you go and call the elders, and they come, they anoint, and they pray, you are expecting them to pray to God for you, over you. They're not praying to you, and they're not praying to one another. But the elders come to pray for us to God. James 1.17 hangs over all of this. We know that every good and perfect gift is from God alone. So if I'm holding, hoping that an elder or another Christian can provide what I think I need, I'm going to end up woefully disappointed. There's no two ways about it. Therefore, all prayers must be to God if they are actually to work at anything. Lastly, James understands that whatever we say makes a comment about the God we say we serve. Again, related to the letter of James, this time James 2.18, where before he said, I'll show you my faith by my works. Here we comment on the sovereignty and faithfulness of God by our words. It's still this action. It's still this thing that's emanating from our lives. But the things that we say, the way that we pray, and the way that we grumble all say something about the God we say that we serve. So in a very brief synopsis, is this, that all of our speech is before God, all of our requests are to God, and all of our words describe the God that we serve. So if we're walking with God like we should, and if we have been changed the way that he wants to change us, then the people of God should be a praying people. For as Paul wrote, we should be praying without ceasing. We pray all the time. Suffering? Pray. Cheerful? Sing a psalm. But even if it's directed to another person, it still offers glory to God. So it's still to God. Sick, then pray. Really sick, then call on the elders so that they can pray for you. They can anoint you with oil and pray over you, and then you pray along with them. Now, when we look at this particular exhortation here in James, when he talks about being anointed with oil and being prayed over, we need to go ahead and say something here. There's nothing special or magic about anointing oil. There's nothing special about the oil that's being placed on the person being prayed for. At the same time, it's not nothing. What it is is a faith release point for the person who is praying and the person who's being prayed for. Now, I've gone to people's homes where uh, they, they wanted me to come and pray over their home. They, they just bought it and they just moved into it, and I always did the same thing. I said, no, you're going to pray uh, for your home, and I'm going to walk with you and pray in agreement with you. And sometimes I would have oil, or sometimes it was uh, I just wouldn't have any, and, and they would be like, well, what do we use? I said, well, what do you have in your kitchen? i be like, we can't use this. This is just this or Wesson oil or something like that. I said, it'll dab. Let's go. You see, the oil, what it does is it helps the people involved confess that only the Spirit of God can grant what's being asked for. It connects you to that understanding and that idea. That's why oil is used and not something else. But even beyond that, and it is beautiful, there's something else about it. There's the slickness of the oil when it's on your fingers and when you're touching what it is that you're anointing. Even if it's just common oil from inside the kitchen, there's a fragrance to the liquid. And what it does is it helps connect all the senses to the moment. It's kind of like baptism and communion. It turns a primarily auditory experience of praying into a fully immersive experience. Just like with baptism, it touches all of your senses down to your taste because when you go down in that water and you come up, you can taste the water you've just been in. Just like communion, it touches every single one of your senses. All of you are alive in that moment. Prayer and anointing does the same thing. And it helps the worshiper to surrender all of them to all of him. But the oil is not some secret part of the petition. In James 5.15, James doesn't say that the anointing oil will save the sick. He says the prayer of faith will save the sick. Or some translations say that prayer offered in faith will restore one who is sick. 
And just to make sure that we understand what James is saying, he then follows that up with verse 16, that the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now, again, depending on your translation, the the equivalent of the phrase effective fervent may be translated in a number of ways. Effective fervent is very King James. The NIV puts it as powerful and effective. The New American Standard puts it as effective and accomplished and actually separates the words out. It's only one Greek word in the original text, but it puts one word at the beginning and another word at the end to make sure you understand that all of it is being captured inside of it. But there's only one Greek word the, behind the idea of effective and fervent, and it's the Greek word energeo. We see this exact same Greek word conjugated in the exact same way in only one other place in the Bible, Galatians 5.6 where Paul is begging the, the church in Galatia not, not to leave the freedom that they have in Christ. He's asking them, don't become entangled with the points of the law, but instead hold fast to the liberty that we get through Jesus. For the law can do nothing on its own. We were set free by faith, working, same word, energeo, working through love. And the idea behind the word is this feeling of constant pressure, constantly pressing in. That God keeps working through us as long as we keep pressing into him. Now, here's the incredibly hard thought that goes along with this verse that we need to understand. Because it's one of those verses that can be used as a hammer against the one who is hurting. What if I pray and I pray for a need that I confess is greater than me? But God doesn't do what I asked him to do. Or he does it, but not in the way that I asked him. There are not many questions that are more honest than that question in the body of Christ. I think we can all argue that that question is probably present throughout the history of the church. How many millions, if not billions, of saints have all asked the exact same question when they read this letter from James? I begged him, and he did nothing. I implored him. I confessed. I did everything that he said. All the steps that are here in the passage, I did it. So what's going on? And I think that's why James gave us Elijah to be used as the example for this statement. So here's the question to go into it. Why would Elijah fervently, earnestly pray for no rain? What kind of a sadistic madman would ask for a drought, knowing that thousands would suffer? knowing that a lack of rain would punish people and animals alike. So if he knew the amount of suffering that was likely to come out of a drought, then why, oh, why did Elijah pray for it? In order to understand this, we need to understand what Elijah actually did. And we're not told anywhere in the text that Elijah prayed for a drought because of his own desires. It doesn't really appear, at least recorded in the text, that he prayed for a drought at all. It doesn't mean James is a liar. It means James understands something that we don't. Instead, what the text has is a moment where the wicked king Ahab took the throne at the end of 1 Kings chapter 16. It starts listing all these things that Ahab did, and it starts off with this idea. He was more wicked than any of the kings that came before him. He did things that nobody should have done. Things happened under him that never should have happened in Israel. And then chapter 17 opens up, and Elijah declares that as the Lord lives, that, that if the, I serve the one true God, then there will be no rain, no dew from heaven, unless I ask God to send it. Now, again, it doesn't say in the text that he asked God to stop sending rain. It does show an action on his part in the drought. But what he was expressing in that moment is that it's not Baal who co controls the weather. It is the Lord God of Israel who controls the weather. And he has revealed to me, and I am now telling you, that there will be no rain until I pray for rain. Now, there's a hard thing. We understand some of the terrible stories that are going to come out of this particular season. Elijah's not going to hear it. He's actually going to be taken out of it. But understand that Elijah was not trying to punish Israel. He wasn't trying to bully them around. But see, this is why Elijah can be a part of this. He understood the stakes of the game. Elijah knew what he was fighting for. And as terrible as everything was going to happen, the way that some of the nightmare stories are going to come out as you continue through 1 Kings, 
He's not fighting for the temporary comfort of a nation. Three years sounds terrible, but three years is only three years. He's not fighting for temporary convenience. He is fighting for the eternal souls of the people. And he's not just fighting for this wicked generation under King Ahab. He is fighting for the generations to come. And Elijah wasn't praying for retribution. He was praying for repentance. He was praying for revival. And he's praying for a people to surrender of God, but to surrender to God. But the thing that Elijah understands is sometimes we don't is that surrender had to start with him first. Elijah had to surrender his heart to the will of God and to be able to pray earnestly and sincerely that, Lord, whatever you want, I want that too. And if you think that drought is best, if you think the suffering that's going to come out of drought is best, I surrender to you. Now we see this heart modeled perfectly by Jesus in the garden, of course. Just prior to being taken by wicked men, he, he asks his father, if there's any way, please allow this cup to pass from me. Nevertheless, he prays, not what I will, but as you will. Now, you're probably tired of hearing this passage during moments like this talking about surrender, but there's a reason that Bible teachers keep pointing to this particular moment as the example of perfect surrender, because it's the only one. All of us struggle. The rest of us all have doubts. Jesus is the only one who did it perfectly. And while some disciples may have a moment of spirit-filled prayer where they surrender solely to God, maybe there's little moments here and there as you go through the text where it seems like, oh, David really had it all together. Oh, this person really understood what it was. Oh, think about how this one prayed and just cried out to God. But we all know that within those lives, there eventually comes a moment when the doubt sneaks in, when the resolve starts to weaken, and the questions start. We see this in the life of John the Baptist. John the Baptist is an amazing individual. There's really no one quite like him in the entire Bible. Even Elijah, they're, they're, they're close, but they're, boy, they're still not that similar. Because John the Baptist was the first prophetic voice in 400 years. He recognized who Jesus was from the womb. Elijah doesn't have that. He baptized Jesus, but only after asking Jesus to baptize him first, because he understood who Jesus was. He watched the Spirit of God descend upon Jesus in the form like a dove, and he confessed with his own mouth that Jesus was the Lamb who, Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And yet, despite everything John the Baptist had seen, even what he had confessed, even John the Baptist had moments of doubt. And when John the Baptist was in prison, he reached out to Jesus and he asked him, are you really the Messiah? I, I know what I said. I said it publicly. Some of your disciples came because I said this statement. And I know what I saw. Everyone saw it. We all heard what happened that day. But are you really the one we're looking for? Or is there someone else? The sweetness of Jesus in that moment is overwhelming in the, in the face of such weakness and doubt. Jesus could have, if he wanted to, just sent a scathing message back. Who do you think you're talking to? Did you not understand all the things that you saw? Even just that one day of the baptism, wasn't that enough? How can you possibly have doubts? Jesus doesn't even talk to John the Baptist like he does to his disciples. And he's, well, you have little faith. Why did you doubt me? Instead, what he does is he points back to the scriptures, specifically pointing to Isaiah 35 and Isaiah 61. And he says, tell them this. Tell them the things that you're seeing. And when he hears about it, he will know. He will know that only the Messiah could have done this. But then after sending the message and sending those messengers off, Jesus turns to the crowd and he tells them his thoughts about John the Baptist. And he says, of all those born of women, there is no one who has been awakened, who's been raised up by God, who's greater than John the Baptist. What a statement. It is very similar to how God talks about Job. Have you considered my servant Job? How there is no one like him on the entire planet. That's how Jesus talks about John the Baptist. There's such tenderness and affection and knowledge of him. And if even John the Baptist, one who is uh, the greatest among all of us born of women, if that's true for him, then what hope do we possibly have? This is why James encourages us to confess your struggles with one another. Not to gossip, but to ask for help. 
so that when I'm weak, you can be strong and lift me up, and when you're weak, I can help bear you up. But finally, we have these last two verses from this letter from James. There's this very gentle note of softness in the last two verses. It's interesting because the rest of James has been very stern. I mean, there's soft moments from here and there, but sometimes he just brought fire and brimstone down upon us. But then we have these last two verses, and they're so sweet. It's almost like if you could see the letter, like these would be written in the smallest words. And I think it's like that because in a way, these last two verses, these are the story of James. If you remember, James is a half-brother of Jesus. He mocked the Lord during his earthly ministry. When the brothers knew that the religious elite were looking for Jesus, they were going to try to seize him and arrange for his death. He was goading Jesus on, oh, go ahead and go out there in public. You know, nobody who wants to be known does stuff in secret. Like the rest of the siblings, he questioned the mental mindset of Jesus. He felt that Jesus needed to be minimized in order to protect the family as a whole. But then after his death and resurrection, Jesus comes to James specifically, very purposefully, almost before the other ones. It's an interesting moment. And then James goes on to be the leader of the early church in Jerusalem and to write this very letter, a letter that's addressed to Christians with the purpose of encouraging the faithful but turning the wayward back to the truth. Remember how the letter went over and over again. Why are you doing these things? It should not be among Christians that you treat one person this way because they look to be rich and another person that way because they look to be poor. Christians, how dare you allow these words to come out of your mouth? How can good and bad come from the same place? Christians, why aren't you praying the way that you're supposed to pray? Why don't you turn back to the truth? And then he adds it this way, the one who turns a wayward one from this way, they save souls from death and they cover a multitude of sins. James did all this. He wrote this letter not because he needed to balance the scales of his life, but because this is how he shows on the outside how Jesus changed him on the inside. This letter is how G- James shows his faith by his works. But please notice what the final verse says. One who turns a sinner from his error, from the error of his ways, will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Now, it's very interesting because the question we should have as Bible students is, whose death, whose sins? Now, some translations say, save his soul. The translators are trying to help us understand who it is they believe that he's talking about. And, but that's a little bit of a rough translation because there's no possessive pronoun in the Greek. Instead, the idea is that the person who's doing the turning is turning the sinner away, or the sinner away from the sinner's way, and the person doing the turning is saving the sinner from death, from his own death. But then there's still this kind of loose phrase at the end and covering a multitude of sins, and okay, I I understand the sinner is being saved from the sinner's own death, but who's covering these sins? Whose sins are being covered? Like, 1 Peter 4, 8, James appears to be referring to Proverbs chapter 10, verse 12, that love covers all sins. This statement has an interesting construction because we know that our Jesus does more than just cover our sins. Our Jesus washed our sins away. That's what the writer of Hebrews tells us, that the sacrifice of Jesus is superior because it doesn't have to be repeated. When he said, it is finished, it is done. So is this statement in James 5 a reference to what Jesus did, or is this something that we're being asked to do? The hint towards the meaning is found in James 5.19, where James describes someone who was exposed to the truth, so arguably someone who's already been saved and appears to have wandered away from the truth. If that person wanders off and someone else turns them around, they save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. We see the fullness of this idea in Genesis chapter 23. In this passage, we have a moment after the flood where Noah had become a farmer, planted a vineyard, and in time, he fermented the grapes that he grew, and he made wine, and then one day he became drunk and ended up naked in his own tent. Not the finest moment in the life of Noah. Noah was the voice of righteousness in a world gone mad. When nobody else followed the Lord, Noah cried out for God. 
And after the flood, he has this moment of weakness where the spirit of wine was more seductive than the spirit of God. And he, and he lays just passed out in his tent, and his son Ham finds him. And we're told that he, he saw his father's nakedness, and when this is combined with the fact that he went and then and told his two brothers, the idea is that he was happy to see his father this way. He delighted in telling others about the failure of his dad. He thought it was funny, mocking his dad, treating him like this condition. It's this mocking tone in his heart that will later lead to the separation between Ham and his entire family. But as Bible students studying the letter from James, we need to look at the other two brothers, Shem and Japheth. Because we're told when these two brothers learn what happens, what they do is they take a garment. And the idea appears to be that they stretch out this garment between them. And then they walk in backwards into the tent so they can't really see what's going on. And they walk in, and as they get closer to their dad, they cover him with the garment. So even when they turn around to kind of see where he is, they have not seen, they haven't exposed his nakedness. In fact, they've covered him. They covered the sin that he had walked into that night, and they did it with their love. And then we're told very specifically, the brothers made sure not to look at their father when he was in this condition because they didn't want to see him this way. They didn't want this image of him at his lowest to be in their head. They took no joy in seeing him fall. They wanted to, as much as it depended upon them, to see him at his best. And this is the idea in 1 Corinthians 13 when Paul is describing the attributes of love. And in verse 6 and 7, he tells us that love doesn't rejoice in equity, not just in committing it. It doesn't rejoice when it sees somebody else fall. It rejoices instead when truth prevails. Love bears all things, including the weakness of the one who is struggling. It believes all things, not in ignorance, but because it wants to believe the highest about the one that it loves. Hope endures all things. It, it hopes all things. It never gives up on you. And this is how we're supposed to love one another. For this is how Jesus loves us. Father, we love you. And we praise you, mighty God, for this letter. It has been very convicting, so powerful. And there's portions of it. Lord, I pray that we are never the same after reading it this time. But Father, I thank you for these closing words, these last two verses from James. They are so soft. They are so sweet. You can almost see him just weeping as he's pinning these words out because he knows what it is that his Jesus did for him, how he was turned around, how his life was saved, how his soul was saved, how his sins were washed away. And the one letter we have from James all has this purpose, Lord, to help those who should know better, who do know better, who perhaps are born again, to turn them around and to draw them back to you. Father, we pray for ministries like this for ourselves, that we'd be this kind of positive influence, this beautiful influence, this attractive influence for those who do know you, that we wouldn't be so stuck on our own whatevers that we would be an obnoxious smell for those who come close. Father, we want to have hearts that are beautiful and for you. We want those who know you to come here and just feel right at home, even if this isn't their home. But just the fact that you are worshipped and you are glorified and we are determined to live our life alongside you. They come in and they find a resting place for their feet, a peaceful place for their souls as they gather their strength and prepare to go back out into battle. Help us to continue to be that oasis you have so long called us to be. Because we're not, a, we're not a place for you to hang your hat and to live here forever. We're a place for you to get your strength back and go back out into the fight. So help us to continue to do all those things, Lord. To be equipped. And then to be about our Father's business. I praise you for this letter from James. And I praise you for what it is that we're going to go into next. Because this, the learning doesn't stop. The pressing in doesn't stop. So, Father, just may this whet our appetite for something greater. Lord, we love you, and we praise you for moments like this. I am so thankful, Lord, to be called according to your purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Family, we'll have one last song.